for giving us a little insight in, as we would say in American English, how the sausage gets made uh, here at the conference. <laughs> so thanks very much, Cyril, and over to our first panel. Thanks very much. So as I mentioned, on the level both of politics, geopolitics, the 30,000 foot level, but also in business and how those conversations coincide, these have been challenging years because it, they have demanded profound medium term change, but they have also demanded seeing the gray rhinos, seeing the predictable surprises. And then when you see them, how do you get the other people to see them too? And so that is, in part, the substance of the conversation that I will have with this first panel. It aligns with one of our seven principles, of course, of hindsight and foresight. So after this little intro, join me in welcoming our first panel to the stage. So welcome to St. Gallen, all of you. Not everybody's been here with the same amount of frequency. Um, you may know them, um, but I will introduce them to you. Rene Obermann, I think for anybody bearing a German passport, uh, is uh, for many of us known as the longtime CEO of Deutsche Telekom, uh, now a director at Warburg Pincus, but also uh, in, and this is I think primarily what we're gonna lean into on the board and uh, leading future questions for Airbus. Um, next to him is Anahita Toms, who is a very well-known sustainability lawyer, uh, partner at uh, Baker and McKenzie, um, but has really truly looked at global questions of sustainability, regulatory issues, and how we move some of the most pertinent and burning questions forward in a way that our societies can handle. And Gerald Butts is in some ways a, a jack of all trades, has had a long life both in um, advocacy and governance, um, ran and advised Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's campaign, helped the Liberal Party uh, become possibly what it was. In, anyway, we'll talk about that <laughs> later. Um, but uh, is now uh, with Ian Bremmer, one of the leaders of the Eurasia Group, so does risk and foresight for a living, but uh, has also a career in advocacy, uh, having been at the WWF in, in Canada. So all three of our uh, participants here have long and varied careers. Gerald, I want to start with you, and I want to explore um, with this panel really both the dimension of how one thinks about personally around foresight things that are coming up and how you then navigate that in your professional roles and in the societies in which you operate, but then also uh, probe on the issues. So I wanted to start with this question to all three of you. Um, when you have seen something that, you know, the gray rhino, the right. predictable surprise, um, that no one else is seeing or wants to see necessarily uh, throughout your career? What have been the things that you've seen or not seen? What have you missed mm -hmm. that then sort of took you by surprise and changed the way that you went about your, your day in the structure in which you were? Thanks, Catherine. And Catherine was kind enough to give us in advance the first question she was going to ask. So it gave us both the opportunity and the curse of trying to figure out what the appropriate <laughs> answer was uh, ahead of time. And I, I must say, I, I thought a lot about the question of what have I been wrong about over the years? And the truth is I've been wrong about a lot of things. And I think we're all wrong about a lot of things. And part of what I've learned over the course of my career, be it in business, politics, or in uh, advocacy, and I see my good friend Andre Hoffman, friend of the St. Allen Symposium, who's a great leader and career leader in WWF. So thank you for everything you've done for sustainability, Andre. Um, I think you have to learn to forgive yourself about being wrong. The panel that spoke first, Catherine, the, the concept of humility is really important, that we have to um, understand that we have a limited perspective on the world, that when we uh, embrace the concept of complementarity with other people, uh, we're going to see the world in a much more stereoscopic way than any of us can as individuals, and sometimes uh, over time, 
you learn how to separate big things from the small things. In my career, uh, I, was, I got involved in public life really to be an advocate for public education. And I had the blessing of serving under the first person with a science degree ever elected to be Premier of Ontario, which was my first stint in politics. And he told me about something called climate change back in the early part of the um, this century. And what he said to me was, if you trust the science of climate change, then over the course of your career, this will become a bigger, more urgent, and more difficult issue. So invest the time in it now. Be certain and um, confident in our way of apprehending our immediate uh, physical universe that at the end of the day, uh, climate change is not a political issue, though it's treated as one often. It's an issue of physics and chemistry. And sooner or later, people have to reckon with that. So decide for the students, and I see a lot of students in the audience, um, decide what you think are those big things, commit to them over the long term, and you'll be surprised at what kind of a difference you can make on those issues, both in your immediate communities and globally. So diagnostic. Diagnostic clarity. It's interesting in that answer, Gerald, you've, you've bridged, you know, kind of where a lot of things in foreign policy are headed, which is to say, you know, evidence-based foreign policy making is something that's moving very quickly into the diplomatic circles because we're also, after many, many decades of quote unquote getting it wrong and certainly getting the nuances wrong, we've decided that now that we have ubiquity of knowledge and data, maybe we need to move that into the halls of decision making. So that was a nice lead into that. Uh, Renee, you have been in these exalted uh, sort of realms of, of the business in the boardroom. You're now chairman of the board of Airbus. Um, and of course, technology must be the ever-present thing on your mind. But looking first at what you didn't see hmm. coming, is it technology related or was it something else? Uh, it's hard to say where to start. Because um, <laughs> I, I didn't see a lot of things coming. But um, back 20 years ago, uh, we, we, the idea at T-Mobile at the time uh, was to enable everybody by being, complete, by, by being uh, able to remotely participate at everything. Mm -hmm. So the idea was to bring the wisdom of the world into your pocket, more or less. And we thought, great, we have mobility, uh, very fast data networks, and we have other technologies and TCP IP internet technologies, and now we can bring it all together. But we came from a world of vertical integration. We controlled everything in the telecommunications world, and voice services were expensive, text messaging was expensive, everything was expensive and not so user-friendly. But the world was good because we made a lot of money. And it's very difficult to change an organization and to cannibalize yourself, and, um, but yet you have, to, you have to do it. And we underestimated the impact of technology and we underestimated the impact of delayering a value chain. Steve Jobs understood it. He created the iPhone. Our idea of the mobile internet was pretty much a confined environment where we, as telecommunications operator, would control the service. Mm -hmm. And that got disrupted. The other thing which we didn't see uh, early enough uh, was the power of a new currency. And the new currency wasn't the euro, but the new currency was data and your own personal data. All of a sudden, you all were excited to be able to use a lot of internet services for free. I don't know who saw 20 years ago that you were paying with your own personal data. Mm -hmm. We were criticized because messaging would be expensive, and all of a sudden came WhatsApp, and overnight a billion of revenue was gone. See? So, so these things we didn't see. And in hindsight, the learning to me is we need to spend more and more time on understanding the impact of technology and potential disruption. Um, and, and we need to understand that these changes happen ever faster. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So well, we'll we, need get... to more, we need to take more time to think, basically. Yeah. Well, we'll get into how we do that when we're in the eye of the tornado, when everything is moving so fast, when all of you are demanded to make decisions at snap notice. Naita, you're a leading trade lawyer. You look at the sustainability issues, you know, both obviously on the basis of the science, but also on the trade component. How do we, you know, achieve value, and we heard yesterday about how we might achieve value with values. Um, so what did you not see? And when you saw something, did you have enough people to listen to you? Well, the 
second part of the question is the even trickier one. I think I would say I have not seen many things like, just like my co-panelists. And uh, just to take a step back, I started in real estate law, 2008. So the people in this room, most of them will know what that means. So I had then the opportunity to support my trade law colleagues in a big law firm. And there, for the first time, I saw where I am actually talented in, what I'm really interested in. So while I didn't see much, uh, apparently or obviously, starting, I realized when I started in trade um, that this is my passion and I'm very interested in looking beyond. And this is, I think, what we have to be a little bit, um, uh, you know, if, if we look at ourselves, it's too limited, obviously. Mm -hmm. And if we look only into organizations, it's too limited as well. So looking into regions globally, um, that is the, the, the key, and, and that's why we need many people to come together. So I think I have um, not, I, I've, I, I should have seen more things, also from a trade perspective coming. But when I saw things early, it was challenging because people don't want to see some of the things that they should be seeing. Sometimes it's a generational question. Sometimes, though, it's not about generation, but it's about saving the, the status quo that you want to save for yourself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I think that is something that I saw throughout the last 12, 13 years where I tried to push sustainability in corporates was that some people were didn't really understand, but others just didn't want to understand. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. challenging the second and bringing along the first that I mentioned is, I think, the, the strategy that I, that I tried. Well, when I opened this morning, I said, you know, our countries have learned hopefully a lot about complacency, and Renee just said that so nicely. Times were good. How do you motivate people yeah. when, you know, in, to change? Because, again, change but gets often profound loss when you, you know, we sort of have cast the idea of change in positive terms, but when you shift something, meaning to say a standing order is always there for a reason, even dysfunction is there for a reason. It serves certain purposes, right? So to get people to see what these three have seen is often uh, quite challenging. So Gerald, one, going back to geopolitics, I mean, when we had uh, the invasion uh, of the sovereign territory of Ukraine, uh, those of us in the business, um, and I'll remember, I'll remind this audience, of course, of, of 2008, I'll remind them of 2014. I was at the Munich Security Conference when Petro Poroshenko was holding up uh, the Russian passports to say, these are not unknown green men. I'm sorry, I can show you exactly who these people are. And of course, we had all the uh, information from the intelligence services from the United States. And yet the Europeans were uh, particularly slow to move. Um, why? Well, it's incredible what we can choose not to see, right? When it's, when it's in our interest not to see it. And um, I'll refer back to what I said at the beginning, separating big things from small things, really important in life, really important in politics, really important in geopolitics. And the big piece of furniture that Europe decided to move around the room was energy security. And one particular approach to energy security that they thought would branch out and solve multiple problems. But the remainder within that equation was a much larger problem that could, that, you know, one of my favorite uh, authors, William Faulkner, famously said that the past isn't dead, it's not even past. Mm -hmm. And um, we may think that geopolitics was dead in Europe for 20 years, but it, wasn't, it was only lightly sleeping, right? And now we're confronted with something that hindsight tells us we should have seen coming. Uh, but we're stuck with a, uh, uh, an arrangement of assets from a geopolitical perspective that makes it very difficult to change that situation. So it's easy to look back and say that everybody was wrong in um, uh, the first decade of this century in assembling those assets in that arrangement. And there certainly were lots of people who were questioning the wisdom of that at the time. 
But the real question now is what do we do about it, right? So that we don't repeat those mistakes, so that we don't concentrate so much interest in one or two assets. Mm -hmm. And I think the jury's still out to be totally blunt as part of our brand at Eurasia Group, not to tell people what they want to hear, but what we see. Um, I think the jury's still out as to whether it's going to be a successful outcome in Europe. Are we, just one half question, since we didn't listen profoundly to mm -hmm. the 2007 speech that Vladimir Putin also gave at the <laughs> Munich Security Conference and moving forward, uh, Lavrov in uh, 2018, who basically called Munich a proto-fascist yes. state. There were all, I was always there in the room for all of these things. And I, yeah. you know, it seemed to be quite obvious and yet uh, people seem to be more comfortable sitting on their hands. Xi Jinping is making certain things quite blatant, mm -hmm. quite obvious. He has a philosophy for the future of his country. Um, and we'll talk about what this means in technology terms and what this means for global sustainability. But um, are, are, we, are we listening? As, are are the, the three strategies that I see that we're starting to try to put into place as a part of the Western mm -hmm. and more globalizing community, is that heading in the right direction? Is that real? Does that show learning to you? I, it does, but I think it's too soon to tell. Uh, personally, I'm very uncomfortable with um, the way really wise people I know, deeply experienced people I know in uh, different countries around the world are starting to refer to each other as enemies. Mm. That I find that is historically, when you look at um, similar periods, the great Canadian historian Mar Margaret Macmillan has written extensively about this and how uh, eerily similar it is to the period leading up to World War I. One, yeah. Um, it's like a lot of <laughs> deep breaths in the room when I said that, and understandably so. I, I worry about those things. I have two teenagers, and uh, the world that they were born into a seemingly short period of time ago seems like a distant memory. Mm -hmm. uh, and I worry about how that change could accelerate and end in a cataclysm. So I, I think we're more clear-eyed about the... Um, the challenges and real threats in the, the leadership of the People's Republic of China. Mm -hmm. um, but I hope that we don't lose sight of the bigger picture that we all have to inhabit this planet and it has to be inhabitable. Yeah. Yeah. Renee, I read in a, a recent um, interview in the Neue Zürich Zeitung that, you know, technology uh, gives you anguish, even paranoia keeps you up at night, um, and some of the ideas, I mean, exactly to Gerald's point, you know, we used to, again, hubris, hmm, the danger of hubris, mm -hmm. used to think that technological developments happen in open societies, you know, Silicon Valley being the, the, the prototype, but also we were just talking about the incredible um, R&D base in Europe. We just don't know how to bring it to market, but that's a different story. Um, but the point is, you know, open societies beget ideas and innovation. And then in China, suddenly, you saw the beginning of this of that you, Google was there, they learned from Google, they learned from the West, and then they closed off. And suddenly we see you know, a race in AI um, like we've never seen before. So, but these are, again, the things we can see. So what is our response as learning organizations on the tech front? For you at Airbus, the, in the defense sector, in the tech sector, how do we, how, what do we take into the immediate future from this? learning? I think the, the first thing which makes me nervous is the hardening demarcation line between the authoritarian and the Western states. And to your point, at the beginning, there was the word, am Anfang war das Wort. And uh, so the, the language escalation makes me very nervous. That coupled with, you know, the, the global issues we face, I think is a poisonous mix. Mm -hmm. um, Technology, particularly AI, has so far been widely underestimated in its potential to escalate not only the good things, but also the conflicts, and to be an essential element of new weapons. We cannot imagine what their destruction Capable potential of. is. Yeah. So I think one of the first most important things to do, and I'm positive on technology, I want to embrace technology, I want to use technology to create and so on. So, so I'm not a technology skeptical person, but I do think we need to work closely together to create a new global charter, mm -hmm. perhaps comparable to the non-proliferation treaty, 
on nuclear weapons. Um, because nukes do not evolve themselves further. But <laughs> AI does. AI does. And I, I think we, we must learn from, from you know, the last couple of months very quickly. And I'm afraid we are too slow. And I'm afraid we're not getting our acts together. And, and you know, this is not a thing where some individual member states of Europe, like Italy or so, can come up with a great regulation to limit the deployment of AI. This is something we need to address globally. And, and of course, many other things we need to address globally, particularly around climate. But, but for AI, I think we, we are in an urgent situation. Mm -hmm. This stuff gets evolved. It's almost like a, a trial, a life trial with the whole of humanity without any rules. Mm. I mean, can you imagine you design a car without brakes? Yeah. That's, this, I mean, not only the ethicists are worrying about this, but uh, we should all be worried about this and what this means for our individual lives, our capacities. And I spent a lot of time last week talking about uh, President Biden's renewed candidacy. But the one thing that the Europeans hadn't seen is that the other side of the political coin immediately put out a video that was AI generated that sort of pulled together, but then spun out. Um, all of the potential, uh, you know, ageist uh, problems that this president would have. And that was seen far more often than the actual candidacy video. And again, so this, this gets to the point of it, it is going to affect the heart of our democracies, the way that we interrelate with one another, the way that we understand the view of the world. I and mean, you might think that our media environment has done enough for that, but it there's a lot more to come. It takes a few seconds of a video with, with your voice and your, your images to impersonate you to the extent that nobody in this room could tell the difference mm -hmm. if it's you or not you. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is scary and stuff. And this ahead of the historic election year, I think 35 elections, Gerald, get, mm -hmm. correct me, next year, uh, the world will be voting and the world will be seeing some of this. So this is where, you know, this is the world's warning to be eyes wide open. Anahita, um, the other thing that... <laughs> happened over the past few years, is particularly in your discipline, that we saw that trade could be weaponized, that we could, that there were nodes of power, uh, of concentration of, of, of economic resources that could be put into play that then would work against some of the things that you care deeply about, which is how we get a sustainable uh, uh, global trading system, a sustainable uh, ecologically bound trading system. Um, so is this, is this parts of the world doing the cash cow move, like going to the last, um, you know, with an incendiary drive? Or, or how can they be brought to seeing, uh, or, you know, leaders but organizations to be seeing another perspective? I think it is a... Um, I think more, more and more organizations and business leaders see it. The question is, what do they then do? So it took a very long time to realize that, you know, we need to invest in innovation to support more resilient mm -hmm. as well as more sustainable uh, supply chains. Mm -hmm. To just become very concrete on your yeah. questions, because we're, we're talking about geopolitics. Some people, because they think geopolitics is something that has nothing to do with right. me, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And, and I think this is so wrong. It has to do with every single organization. If you are a startup or if you are the CEO of a big uh, organization, it makes, in my view, a key difference to what you do. So first of all, awareness and testing and retesting and retesting your perspective. That is something that I always uh, recommend, particularly supervisory boards, because they have the power to ask their boards to say, are you sure you have thought about this? The second thing is then to do things. What do you do? And you can wait and see what global laws will be enacted. And you can start, or you can start with what you are convinced of. So in the space of sustainability, there has been for a very long time soft law that many companies liked to ignore. Others, though, wanted to be at the forefront. Yeah. Like and Airbus. imagine, yeah. Like Airbus. Yeah. <laughs> but imagine, <laughs> and he can talk about Airbus the, in a this second. This is the product placement part. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
And the question is, where do you want to be? Because the hard law will come. I said that 10 years ago, I said that many years ago, and now we're there. And imagine who has the best suppliers now, who has the most sustainable ones. So I think strategic foresight is not something in the back of some room uh, discussed with very, very smart geopolitic advisors, but it's something very concrete and relevant for each organization. And that's why we not only need a unit that just does it in an organization, and we need tone from the top, of course, but we also need to create a culture that everybody wants to own it. I want to understand what, where is my company heading at, mm. and I'm sure that the students in this room are super interested mm -hmm. to be part of this culture, part of this movement, to strategically think about where do we want to be in 10 years, but be, be strategic, I always say, but also be creative. Mm. Leave some room of, you know, for, you know, we never know what is coming. And this is all about this, right? This is about the session we all don't know. Um, but just because you don't want something to happen, <laughs> that's, that, that, that is a high risk and a risk for the supervisory boards, for the executives, for the politicians, for all of us. Mm -hmm. Well, because time, of course, waits for no man or woman or organization. <laughs> and I think that's, you know, when somebody from the highest echelons of German government says, well, we're a security policy teenager. Unfortunately, the world uh, can't wait for Germany to grow up. That's mm. my editorial statement of the day. <laughs> <laughs> Zip that. Very good. Um, Renee, but Anaida's just given us a prescription of mm. how this should work in yeah. the boardroom. Yeah. Um, you have a lot more data on which to work with, right? Technology also helps with the data component. Mm -hmm. But now you've heard how it should work in practice. You are privy to many boardrooms now, not just as the, the board chair of Airbus, but, uh, you know, in your capacity at Warburg Pincus, mm. you've... So in practice, how does that work? And then conversely, using the data that you have now, the information we heard, Desmond Lee is in the audience, uh, minister from Singapore who works on planning for the city-state of Singapore and said, look, we get a whole new group of people together. We get businesses together, we get government together, we get people together who will ask us the difficult questions. So how do you do that in practice? On a regular basis, I mean, we, we, we provide room and time for regular updates on uh, geopolitical matters. Uh, we discuss, because it's a very, the aerospace industry is a global industry by nature. And therefore, you know, the, the questions we have around our future positioning in China or, or the, uh, how we, you know, discuss India and, and other countries of the world, how we sometimes manage the conflict between what we're being required or expected to do, for instance, from the US side um, uh, in, in, in other regions of the world, the potential of further, further sanctions uh, and sanction regimes, expansion and so on. So we, we just discuss those things on a more regular basis. We seek external advice and insights. And, um, and you know, whenever we think in aerospace, we do think long term anyway, because some of our programs would be like 15 or 20 years development programs, like the future combat air system, which Europe badly needs, I think, for increasing its strategic um, autonomy and ability to defend itself for a better security architecture, which it has long neglected. Yes. Um, that does require a more united Europe mm -hmm. and a more united thinking and a much more united strategic planning between the political and the business side, just to give you a few elements of Yeah, so do. that's perfect. So how, how and when do you talk politics? Because just as you were saying this, I'm thinking of that picture of the German chancellor and the American president sitting in the White House. And, you know, we don't really have a readout of that conversation, but Eurasia and I and other people who are in, you know, the, the work of trying to figure out what happened behind closed doors. I don't know if you came to the same conclusion I did, but um, my thinking was that President Biden was saying to Olaf Scholz, when the sanctions come, when simultaneity strikes, when something happens across the Taiwan Strait, have you spoken to your businesses and engaged with your businesses because we will, as the quote unquote, still indispensable power, things are shifting, um, demand that you know a principal architecture of the West goes with, and that will mean changes for your businesses. That was my supposition. I don't know if you came to a different I, conclusion I think... of what happened there, but you know, my point is, 
businesses are doing this. Our government, our governments and business listening enough to one another to be ready for, you know, the macro and the micro meeting one another? Well, I think a lot of progress has been made. This is my turn to do the product placement. This, yeah, is, this is what we do for a living at Eurasia Group. We talk to <laughs> boards and business leaders about what's happening in the world and how it changes their business model and the security of their supply chains on a variety of macro vectors. But I, I think that um, in the case that you described, my own instinct is that when, when, if and when a conflict comes between, a real conflict comes between the United States and China, I'm doubtful that it will happen because of Taiwan. Uh, and I think that we have lulled ourselves into um, thinking that this is just my own personal view, by the way. Um, and the re part of the reason I think it won't come because of Taiwan is because everybody thinks it will come yeah. because of Taiwan. Foresight. And uh, people forget this, but when China joined the WTO in 2000, its economy was smaller than Canada's. Yeah. And it's now roughly, depending on the metric, the same size as the United States. And the way that happened was a deep enmeshing of the supply chains in the West and the East. And to assume that the biggest piece of furniture, to use my earlier analogy, in 2000, which was Taiwan, would precipitate the conflict that we're all expecting, I think is, is it, it, it's kind of fuzzy thinking. So there are so many other ways we could end up in uh, a large conflict with China than mm -hmm. simply a dispute over mm -hmm. mm -hmm. To respond to your question, because I have been advising companies on sanctions for such a long time. So 20, 2014, that's a moment in time where you can say, well, they, they weren't prepared, Correct. they didn't know, it was a surprise. Some companies, though, sanctions hit, we had proper contractual clauses in place mm -hmm. so that you could continue to invest in certain regions, continue to build factories, continue to work uh, in certain regions. So many clients called, said, in 2017, do you think in the next six months all the sanctions will be lifted? And can we take out this clause that, will, that, that, that triggers so much you know, um, weirdness in the negotiation. I said, no, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. cannot mm -hmm. take away these clauses. Mm -hmm. But some, and, and I would say more those companies who are not in, of course, the aerospace or they, 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 that produce dual use goods because they have really smart advisors on the geopolitical side. It's more the companies who think geopolitics has nothing to do with me. Right. They don't prepare themselves, and they are really wrong, because if you look at the U.S.-China trade war, for example, you don't have to produce dual-use goods to be affected, mm -hmm. as we know, right. looking at the product list, uh, list of peanut butter, for example. Or steel. Mm. Steel, yeah. The Poly ultimate dual-use good. Yeah. yeah, seriously. Motorbikes. Yeah. Huh? yeah. If I could, I think this yeah, is a really, really important point. And what has changed in, in just about every... Uh, government, a head of a government listens to two kinds of people when it comes to foreign policy. One uh, are, his, are her economic policy advisors, the governor of the central bank, the minister of finance, or the treasury secretary, depending on the system. And the other is mostly people in uniform, mm -hmm. right? They're security apparatus uh, who are principally concerned with military and traditional security matters. So for the entire first decade of this century, the economic policy advisors have been saying to governments in the West that China is an opportunity you can't miss. That if you want to grow your economy, you want to get out of the growth trap in the 1990s in the West, the way to do it is to open up the Chinese market to your uh, companies, their goods and services. And the whole time, the people in uniform were saying, don't listen to those economic mm -hmm. policy advisors. Uh, the Chinese do not share our values. Their ultimate aim is to replace us in the global geopolitical firmament. Mm -hmm. And they're just chasing the filthy lucre. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, this is going to come back and bite you. So in the post Xi Jinping period, the folks in uniform have been saying, we were right all along. Mm -hmm. And now heads of government are very reluctant to ignore the advice they're getting from uh, their national security apparatus. So you have to remember at the end of the day, the people in these chairs are people. 
right? And they are making decisions based on limited uh, information. And a lot of times they get it wrong. And when there's a, a, a destabilization of a stable equilibrium in geopolitics, that's when I start to get worried mm -hmm. because people make idiosyncratic decisions mm -hmm. in those circumstances. Mm -hmm. So, but, I, oh yeah, can, go ahead, Renee, I have a follow-up there. I'd be very interested in your view, Jared, on after like 30, 40 years of very intense engagement in China, for instance, mm -hmm. what would be your advice to companies? Should they prepare for a complete decoupling? Mm -hmm. Should they continue to be engaged, just try to build more resilience, i.e. in the supply chains? I mean, how would you handle this? Because in, 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 the, in the world, there are two aspects. One is the geostrategic slash military ethical dimension. Mm -hmm. And there is the dimension of the real existing capital market. And those people who are, happen to be your shareholders and who want you to make yeah. you know, the best out of your business. And that is a very difficult complex okay. uh, complex um, mm. uh, uh, issue to, to kind of bring together. Mm -hmm. What would be your advice to large corporations these days, really, like VW, for instance? Sure, really deep scenario planning, mm -hmm. right? So that, and one of those uh, scenario, scenarios has to be loss aversion. Pardon? Loss, loss aversion. aversion. And that's a difficult thing for uh, boards and C-suites to wrap their heads around. Mm -hmm. But the people who were prepared to leave Russia quickly uh, are going to be better off in the long term mm -hmm. than sure. those who were not. And it's interesting. I, I speak to a lot of heads of, of SMEs, which are, of course, are at the backbone of the of the German economy, mm -hmm. and they sometimes are slightly more able to do that because the boardrooms are smaller, the companies are often spread, or they're already doing a in China for China type thing. So that breakage point, you know, they or the China or a China plus one a, a, approach is interesting. But um, Renee, I wanted to wanted to ask you. I mean, obviously now you see this through the privy lens of of Airbus, but um, you know, when we when we're thinking about this, gets back to this idea of weaponized interdependence, telecommunications. Um, you know, exactly what Gerald described, which is the idea of you know, first it was ex you you set it up so beautifully because of course telecom is avenging to say we have got to get these cheaper services you know to the German and European customer and then to the United States and we're going to do it because there's technology available that's fast and usable oh, yeah. and wonderful. Mm -hmm. And in my own house in Berlin, I could not get telecom. What they said to me is, here, have some mobile ZTE boxes. And I said, oh, great, so I can send my data direct to Beijing. That's great. I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> but you know, this entire fusion of now in the boardroom, you have to see things with a geopolitical uh, lens mm -hmm. in mind. Of course. Um, Take us for this audience. And by the way, we're going to go to questions in four minutes. So I want to get your hands ready. Um, how those interactions then work? Who are you? Who are you interacting with um, to kind of you know get that risk right? And we're not going to probe whether the telecom, whether we're making the right decisions in Germany on uh, strategic infrastructure that's no longer yours. First of all, I, I, to be honest, I I would not say your data goes straight to Beijing. I hope Even not. if you, I mean, you, if you deploy a telecom router, you should be fine. Even I say that eight years later, right? So okay. I'm out, I'm out well, since eight years. But, but your word in God's ear. No, I don't I'm, know about I'm, that. I'm not. I'm only half serious. The, this. <laughs> <laughs> that is not making me feel any better. <laughs> because there are many ways to to get your data. Oh, many great. vectors of attack. <laughs> but it's a big dilemma because, and I take the example of the um, Chinese infrastructure. As you all know, Huawei is in everybody's oh. mind. And pretty much US-led, there was an initiative years ago already started and pressure grew uh, to more or less eliminate Huawei infrastructure from the so-called core net, that is the element of telecommunications networks where the intelligence happens and the, the, the management of, of you as a user and, and so on. And, and, and many companies have started to do that. Some of them have already gone far, far down the road and some not. But when it comes to the radio access technology, where your quality of your, your speed and mm -hmm. data speed and so on, your user experience is really also determined by, swap it out is a bigger challenge. Mm -hmm. And um, so, so I think all the telecoms are in, you know, between a rock and a hard place. If they don't do it, they might be forced and then do it in, in a rush and have little alternative. If they do it now, they risk user experience and a very painful migration. Yep. And 
I don't know. I mean, where are we going? I mean, this is something I, I always struggle to get my arms around. What's the end game of all this? Mm -hmm. You know, we are, we are all, what's the end game? Is where do we end up with China and, and between the US and China? My worry is we're talking ourselves into this growing, growing, growing escalation. Yeah, and I'm sure there are many good reasons for, for being nervous, skeptical, and, and so on. And yes, there are risks. And I don't know what the future brings, to be honest, even though I have many intelligent advisors. But, but seriously, I'm, I'm not kidding you, because nobody knows. I, I, would bear, I would even dare to say even Gerald doesn't know. I do not know. <laughs> I'll be the first to admit but it. But the one thing I, I believe I know is in a decoupled world between China and the US and Europe being dragged into that decoupling, mm -hmm. we're not going to solve the big problems of the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A truer word was rarely spoken on this stage. Okay, questions. Um, I can keep going. I have many things on my cards, but this is really your time. We're going to start right over here with this young man sitting probably in the fifth row. Um, and as always, introduce yourself. Make sure at the end of what you say, your voice goes up and it ends in a question mark. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Ralph, I'm studying international affairs with a focus on geopolitics and security. Um, I like your sentences uh, that you said, Mr. Butts. Um, it's incredible how much some people want to ignore evidence. Um, and I wanted to ask regarding black and gray swan events, basically. Should companies prepare more in, in scenarios? Um, so to really think things through, what what do we do if, I don't know, if really a nuclear weapon is used in Ukraine, for example? Do we have plans for, for this? Um, so yeah, I'm just interested in how, how should companies, or not just companies, how should everyone be, be should they be more prepared with scenario thinking mm -hmm. or, yeah, how to prepare for, for these kind of things? who builds these scenarios? Is this, are you outsourcing this to the Harvard Business School? Or no, is this, no, I'm we kidding. do. I'm, I'm joking, <laughs> go ahead. Uh, I think it, it, by definition, it's hard to prepare for a black swan event, right? Because you don't, you don't um, uh, really know what form it's, going to take, but being uh, in a posture where you're prepared to deal with the unexpected is always advisable. Uh, I will say though, and, and Catherine, forgive me for this, it's, I feel like we're very pessimistic right now. And, um, you know, I, I spent time with, uh, you were in the group yesterday with the leaders of tomorrow, and it was so energizing, the optimism of the students. Uh, and I think that they have every reason to be optimistic. So we can look at the immediate situation geopolitically, politically, economically, and be very depressed, right? But I also want people to leave or be energized by the prospect that things could get a lot better very quickly, mm -hmm. right? That, um, I'll date myself with this, but when I was an uh, undergraduate at McGill, I was in the first class where everybody was assigned an email address which makes me sound a thousand years old to the students in the room. <laughs> but believe me, it was 1991, right? Wow. And 14 years later, when we had our first child, because it was what he saw his father playing with all the time, I think my son's eighth word was Blackberry. <laughs> and that just shows you how quickly things can mm -hmm. change. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't always change for the worse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's so, um, we have all of the technological capability we need to solve climate change. Mm -hmm. The inertial power of the status quo is yep. preventing us from yep. doing it. Yep. Uh, I'm very confident we're going to do that in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. So I just, to the students out there, don't think that we're all depressed and pessimistic about the future. It's really important because sometimes optimism creates its own field and um, you should be optimistic about your mm -hmm. future. Anahida. So to your question on scenario planning, I think it is key to do it but you have to understand the limits within corporations too. It's sometimes a wild card scenario and you, as you know, you plan everything around the wild card, your shareholders will say, sorry, are you crazy? What is COVID? What is a pandemic? Why did you buy 2000 laptops? We will not be, you cannot use it in three months or in six months, we cannot sell it any longer. So I don't think it is fair to the companies to say that they don't, some of them do really deep scenario planning. Mm -hmm. 
But the question always is the second step, what do you do with that? Mm -hmm. And how do your shareholders react? And how can you bring them along on the journey to say, we're going to invest a little bit here, or uh, we are looking at this region because we are going to diversify and digitalize because. So it's a journey, but there are definite limits because there is corporate governance. And it's good that there's corporate governance. Otherwise, we would all buy laptops for everything. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, that, that's, I, I would endorse that. that. There's no glory in prevention. <laughs> <laughs> and that applies to politics. Uh, and I've, I would I ad admire those people who really take political responsibility these days because it's gotten so damn tough. Yeah. Um, and there is not much glory in prevention on the corporate side either. But dare we not to invest in prevention, yeah. i.e. in becoming more resilient against cyber attacks. Yeah, nobody discusses that because shareholders, they, they expect we do everything we need for prevention. It just shouldn't cost much money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but, but there is no, you can't really sell to the market something you do for prevention, which probably has an effect in five, six, seven, ten years out. Because capital markets tend to be more short term and they believe what they see. But good entrepreneurship and good preventive policies are also to do things which you cannot see yet, I mean, which you cannot explain, because there are difficult things to explain sometimes in public. You only have a 30-second attention span. So I think it's very difficult to, be, uh, to, to get support for prevention. For instance, what have we done after the, the, the COVID pandemic now to prevent the next pandemic? Mm -hmm. I'm not so sure how much we invest into this. Yep. Okay, we might have masks now. That's great. But it may not be enough. <laughs> But vaccine distribution is probably still ever going to be complicated. So we have two female questions, one here and one in the front row. We're going to do both of them in sequence as a package, please. So our second microphone can move around here. Fantastic. Thank you. Hi, I'm Isabel. I'm from the UK. I study the political economy of Europe at the LSE. Enemy, friend. Words reflect reality, and reality reflects words. They can change reality in worrying ways. I have a few ideas, but I was wondering what you think about how we can deal with this and how we can de-escalate. Mm, the language of de-escalation. Anahida, can I start with you? Yeah, always use your words wisely. Mm -hmm. But please. <laughs> I mean, I think this is a particularly pertinent question also for Gerald. If we read the friendship agreement between mm -hmm. Russia and China uh, early February, just before the invasion. You read it, and it was the language of multilateralism. I mean, it was the language on which I was raised. And then you look at the realities or what that really means, um, and the signifiers. I mean, these are important signifiers. I think that's the exact right question to the rest of the world, because we are, this is a discussion, mm -hmm. maybe not, you know, on the enemy piece as well, about where the world's going to go. So the importance of, of language. It's vitally important. I would also point out that the Soviet Union had one of the most liberal written constitutions in the history of the world, right? Uh, and it's part and parcel of anti-democratic, uh, be they fascist, autocratic, um, uh, political forces that they mock the language of democracy, right? So words are important, and in particular when they're coming from people where we, we expect an identity between their words and their actions. But it's also really important to back them up. Mm -hmm. Amen. Renee, do you want to say? I, I, I'm probably naive, but I do believe that strong and rather symmetrical dependencies between uh, regions or countries on the trade side are helpful. And people say these days, yeah, you know, it didn't prevent Russia from becoming the aggressor it is or the pariah it has become. That's true. But I still do think there's value in it. So I would therefore advocate for maintaining close trade relationships with China. And the second thing is diplomacy. I don't think I'm an expert to talk about that much. But the third thing I also believe in, and, and that might be very controversial, is deterrence. I think deterrence, particularly in, when it comes to, you know, nuclear weapons, but also in the future, there'll be different forms of, of, of very effective um, weapons. And we talked about that already. 
I think deterrence means we need to say, you know, we are at eye level and we, and, and deterrence has worked in the past and I do think it, sh it will continue to be with us for the future. And if we don't, for at least the foreseeable future, if we don't have deterrence at eye level, for instance, for instance, we, we looked at Russia and watched them position a few hundred nuclear warheads in Kaliningrad. And yet we, what did we do to, to protect ourselves against that or to be able to counteract if needed? I think deterrence is a very effective thing mm -hmm. and uh, next to diplomacy and, and, and stronger trade relations. Okay, so we have a question in the front row. I, I realize I have my own bias and my bias is the, my, my side here. So your question is next and then we're gonna go way in the back for our last question right there to the right, in the right side of the audience and we're gonna take them together. Go ahead. Sandrine Dixon de Clove, and I'm the co-president of the Club of Rome with my lovely colleague, Mumpella, and I'm going to ask a question that brings in a little bit of what my young colleague, Rana, and I have been talking about. Thank you for your deep wisdom. Really wonderful conversation and your leadership. There are a few things that I've seen that are missing from this conversation. One is that risk aversion and also sacrifice aversion. The geopolitics have changed. And a little bit what Mumpella was alluding to we need to figure out what we're willing to sacrifice in the West mm -hmm. within that geopolitical game. Mm -hmm. How do we do that? And within that, I would bring in that prevention aversion that, that you've just brought up, Renee, which is so fundamental. Who then calls for those new governance rules? Mm -hmm. Because we've just seen the head of AI, the guru of AI at Google, step down because he himself is freaked out mm -hmm. about what he's developed. Mm -hmm. We are looking at geoengineering within the realm of climate change, which has no governance rules either. How do we get an alignment between business and governments mm. to make sure that we bring in the necessary governance rules and the prevention that we need for that foresight development and Thank building of really resilience? And who carries that message? I think that's excellent. Go ahead, uh, last, our last question in this round. Oh good, you have the microphone. Yeah. Hello, yes. hi, uh, I'm Fabian, I study political science at the University of Vienna. Um, I love what you said about that prevention is not glory, or there's no glory in prevention, it's not sexy, but then I think the crucial question would be how can we, in a maybe political uh, cooperation, the political side and the, the side you guys are playing the, in the economic world, um, build a framework together to make prevention sexy actually for politicians, <laughs> but also for companies to say, okay, taking corporate political responsibility there's some glory inside. So what incentives would you like to see develop in the future to get in the era and age of prevention? Thank well, you. Well, these questions bracket themselves perfectly. So how, how do we do that? How do we make prevention, how do we make sacrifice functional? Who does that? What bully, bully pulpit does that, that come from? I was hoping you go first. Look at all these people with the answers. That's on the micro level. Okay, uh, Gerald, the macro level. I, I think it's going to be generational. I really do. I think that um, I don't mean to give up on the generation of people currently in power, be it in the private or public sectors, but I think demographics are a really important center of gravity in the world. And uh, you know, when I was born, there were 3.8 billion people on Earth. I have two teenagers. There are 3.5 billion people in their generation. Yeah. And 90% of them are in emerging markets. So I think the most likely uh, place for solutions to emerge is going to be from most of the people on the planet. So two comments. One is um, I want to say to the younger people here, we do more than you think behind closed doors. I believe in small steps. Um, I know that you always tell us we don't have time, but I have seen more progress with those small steps than with the loud voices asking for bigger steps. So I hope that one day we will be able to talk with you about those confidential discussions we have in boardrooms and some who, you know, um, are, you know, uh, role models uh, already speak more loudly. But it's not so that we don't, don't talk about it and we don't push behind the scenes. On the question on prevention is not sexy. In the compliance field, we always say, if you think compliance is expensive, try non-compliance. Yeah. <laughs> mm. I have de developed that further and talked 
exactly the same way about ethics, about sustainability, about anything in this region, and it's also about risk. But again, you have to see the limits because there is always a shareholder in, it, in the background. And if you go uh, bankrupt, you are the one who has decided to, to, to do the prevention in that way. So it's always you know, bringing all the stakeholders together, mm. different generations, investors, uh, nonprofits, and working together on a solution. We need you and you need us, and only together we can do it better. Uh -huh. So on the, on the micro level in, in the organization, there are many, many aspects of resilience. And uh, the true answer is you need to address them one by one. The external ones, for instance, so you keep your license to operate, be accepted by, the, by, by your customers, by the people out there, does require that you as an organization are proactive in the transformation toward climate neutrality. That, I think, is a, an absolute must. And that, you know, whilst it may cost initially quite a lot of money and effort, this is the biggest part of resilience going forward. You can, you can create for your own organization that you're being active and also that you're being seen as active and doing the right things. That's, that's key in, in our organization. But there are many other aspects, and we talked about them, from cyber to the future workplace, how to attract and retain talent. It's an increasing challenge these days. I mean, if, if one of the purposes of today is that I hope that many of you will thereafter come and say, can we work for you or with you? <laughs> So it's very difficult to attract talent and to retain talent. And uh, so resilience has so many aspects. Mm. I, Sand, I, obviously, I'm a, I'm a person who works in public policy, so Sandrine's question always resonates with me. Do we have to rethink what it means to be an elected office? Um, and we had this conversation yesterday uh, on this very stage. Um, and all the three people on this stage said, you know, would they give up their role, their post, if and when it was time to move things forward to continue to have that narrative. And this idea that public service is service uh, and the fact that, you know, you, you are the eye of the needle through which change happens. You might not necessarily be the change, but you are such a crucial element of achieving that, that, that change uh, and pushing those visions. But I think what you've heard from these three people here is that foresight takes work. It takes dedication. It takes planning. It's dangerous. It will force you to be vulnerable at times, often hopefully within you know, the safety of your boardroom. But even when the boardroom is safe, you need to find a way of articulating that more widely, whether it is to government, whether it is to electorate, it, uh, and, and having those conversations, finding a language that works. So foresight, I think, above all, is a practice. And what we heard from these three, it has to be an intergenerational practice. Because as much as I have a bias here on my right side, we all have our own biases, our own inbuilt blind spots that come from how we were raised, how we were put in the world, the languages we speak, the cultures we inhabit. So this is an open invitation you know, for you to use this rest of the day, but to use the time that you step away from Zankalan with the ideas that you bring here to engage in this practice, whatever field you're in. So please join me in thanking, I think, my exceptional panel. Thank you.